I'm going to whistle through my, my own personal uh, views on the experience of, of medical legal practice in the UK over the last 20 years. Um, uh, you saw my declarations of interest that were commercial earlier on. I also declare the fact that I receive instructions from solicitors for both claimants and defendants in cases of neonatology, but specifically in conicterus. Uh, as does Janet Rennie, we're often on either sides of the debate. And between us, I think we've learnt more from the medical legal cases we've had to discuss than we have from our own practice. Um, if I was to ask in this room how many people have seen a clinical case of conicterus, about eight, eight, nine. You know, it is a rare condition we're dealing with. So um, I'm going to touch on this. Now, uh, to, to start off, though, um, I want to, to point out the overlap between neonatology and the law as presented in a humorous way by one of these authors. Now, there's a book called Fetal and Neonatal Secrets in the States, and I think it's particularly for residents to really learn up on how to pass your exams in neonatology. Am I right uh, on this one, uh, Vinny? Have you heard of this book? Yeah, Richard, Richard? You do, do you? Yeah. Oh, good. I've, I've met Richard Poland through his interest in, in non-invasive respiratory therapy, but I'd like to meet Alan Spitzer because he's obviously got a particular sense of humour. Because in the preface of this book, he has the tw Spitzer's 20 laws of neonatology. And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to give you all 20, but I'm going to put a few into my talk just to lighten things up. This is his first law of neonatology. And if I'm ever talking to, if I'm ever talking to a group of, of, of lawyers, I, I've, I've adapted that, and I think it's also true. Um, so what am I going to be talking about in the context of conicterus? Well, in the context of conicterus and deafness, it, it comes down to these main aspects of the failure to detect significant jaundice and the failure to treat appropriately with phototherapy or exchange transfusion. That, that makes it sound all very simple. But it goes wrong time after time after time. Um, the Pilot USA uh, Connectress Registry, which we'd, I presented earlier on, one of the messages that came out from the authors of that registry uh, was as, is as true today as it was then. So conicterus was a systems failure, an inability to identify the at-risk infant and to manage severe hyperbilary anemia in a timely manner. So what does go wrong? And I just drew up this list of systems failures, if you like, uh, and you'll all recognise these. Yeah, so failure to identify the at-risk infant. Failure to detect clinical jaundice. And I'll give examples of that. Failure to measure the serum bilirubin. We've just been talking about that, transcutaneous or, or blood. Um, and a tendency in the past to sort of guess the level of bilirubin, the guesstimate, uh, and see the baby the next day. Oh, still quite mild. And not to actually measure the bilirubin. Uh, failure to adhere to your own guidelines or national guidelines. What else goes wrong? Um, I think when you have a baby in front of you, you might be treating the baby with phototherapy appropriately, but not taking into account the clinical signs in that baby. Are there the features of the BIND score to be recognised? Many of those are warning signs for impending or existing neurotoxicity. And I think we, we ignore those, and we don't document them very well in the clinical record. Uh, failure to use phototherapy appropriately be that uh, multiple or intensive, and failure to perform a timely exchange transfusion. There's, a, there's quite often a, uh, a resistance to the exchange transfusion because it is a clinical palaver to do an exchange transfusion. How many people in the room have done an exchange transfusion? We've got some fairly experienced pediatricians here. If I was teaching a group of trainees in neonatology, even the National Grid trainees in neonatology, there have been many, many of them who've never, never done an exchange transfusion. It's a rare procedure, and therefore it becomes quite a risky procedure. And there are complications inherent in doing an exchange transfusion. So we, we tend to have a reluctance to do the exchange, sometimes to the extent that we're ignoring clinical signs that should push us in that direction. 
So failure to, to identify the at-risk infant. The yellow markings for the first four bullet points there are just reiterating the NICE guideline in the UK, which Ung So, I'm sure, also reiterates that we're identifying babies that have a higher risk of developing what we call, called significant jaundice. And what I mean by significant jaundice is jaundice that needs to be treated at whatever threshold of phototherapy you're using. Or it might even need an exchange transfusion, but that's significant jaundice. And to be added to that are not ignoring the fact that there might be a family history. And I certainly can think of examples on my own unit where a baby's got significantly jaundiced, is evidently hemolyzing, and it's only then that someone goes back and works out that there was a family history of spherocytosis and several people having their spleens taken out as adults. So it's taking the right history. And the conditions that catch us out are G6PD, spherocytosis, and, and Gilbert's disease, we don't it catches us out because it often co coexists with other pathologies because it's so common. If you have ABO incompatibility plus Gilbert's or G6PD plus Gilbert's, you can have a very high serum bilirubin level in no time at all. So that's failure to detect the at-risk infant. Uh, we've all, we keep alluding to the fact that, that breast, breastfeeding and jaundice is a tricky topic. It was quite a tricky topic when we went through the NICE guidelines in 2008 and 2010 um, because of the sensitivities particularly of NICE not wanting to give the wrong message about breastfeeding. But the evidence is out there, and I haven't got time to go through these papers, but the evidence is out there that the intention to exclusively breastfeed a baby or exclusive breastfeeding of a baby does put that baby in the higher risk category in terms of developing significant jaundice through all sorts of mechanisms. Um, I throw this in, Ben Stenson, any of you know Ben Stenson, one of the editors of Archives, uh, we talk about lack of breast milk jaundice, but he was pretty mischievous uh, in writing this. And, uh, or darker still, lack of formula milk jaundice. You wouldn't, you're not going to get away with that uh, in front of a, 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 a group of midwives or with uh, fellows of NICE such as Sarah to, sitting in the audience here. <laughs> Failure to detect jaundice is notoriously difficult to pick up jaundice in the dark skin or black baby. And people suggest blanching the skin of the nose or the forehead, looking at the gums, obviously looking at the sclery as well, maybe your clue. But we do keep missing. If you, if you see the, the babies I see who present with conicterus, there's a disproportionate number where it hasn't been being picked up because of the skin colour. So are we any good at picking up jaundice? Can we clinically detect jaundice when we, when we examine babies? We could probably say yes, no, whether a baby's jaundiced. But I think we delude ourselves into thinking we can guesstimate the level of jaundice in a baby. And I was certainly brought up to guesstimate the level of jaundice in a baby by senior pediatricians, because they used to show me this little man. So this is um, Kramer's, Kramer's little homunculus showing the progression of jaundice from in the cephalocaudal progression. And I was always taught that if a baby had yellow palms and yellow cells of the feet, it was time to get your exchange transfusion kit out because it was the old 20 milligrams per cent or 340 micromoles per litre. Um, it, it, it does seem to equate, but when NICE looked at this, there was no good study evidence that suggested this was a reliable way about going about assessing jaundice. And so... Did it correlate? It showed a poor correlation with the serum bilirubin. There was one study where they trained up the parents to make this guesstimate, and the parents did better than the nurses uh, and the doctors in that study. And although it's quite a useful negative predictive value, so if you've, not, if you've got minimal jaundice, it's just head and neck, upper thorax, days two, three, that probably means you're most unlikely to get significant jaundice. It's not going to rule out significant jaundice developing. So recognition, yes. Assessment, no. Transcutaneous bilirubinometry, we've been talking about. Ang has mentioned uh, transcutaneous bilirubinometry. Um, and he was rightly saying that with NICE, if it's more than 250, check the serum bilirubin. The other point to make with that, obviously, is 
how old is the baby in hours when the bilirubin is assessed? And I think that's an educational point that we have got across to colleagues, community midwives, that a transcutaneous bilirubin of 180 is going to be jolly significant at 18 hours, for instance. Uh, and that's where using the, the table, I, I never like those tables in NICE, by the way. I just, just I can't bear tables. I don't like algorithms particularly either. Um, but there's a beautiful thing, I like a graph. You can tell what you're doing with a graph. There's a, there's a nice, nice app called, do you all, anybody use the Billy app? Anybody? Yeah, I meant to put it onto my phone and put it onto one of my slides. So you can put, you, you, you put in the baby's gestation, you put in the baby's time of birth precisely, you put in your bilirubin values and it plots it for you and it will tell you what to do on the basis of how old the baby is. So don't just get relaxed by the fact that, oh, we can let it go up to 250 with transcutaneous. It depends how old the baby is, obviously. Failure to adhere to guidelines. Now, Janet Rennie, um, I showed you a picture of Janet before. She, before the, she got involved with the NICE guideline, she did this rather clever survey of clinical practice in the UK. Although it was published in 2009, I think the survey was conducted three or four years before. What she did was she sent a brown, paper, brown envelope to everybody, stamped address back to her, saying, please put your jaundice graphs in here and return to me. And so she in her office, she must have this pile of graphs. And you can imagine what they looked like, and mine looked exactly the same. A graph that had been photocopied about a thousand times, you couldn't actually read what was on it, and probably pertained to an era well before that, which applied in the mid 2000s. So she got a bit of a skewed picture, I think, because she was dealing with historical information. But when she put this together, she showed a, a vast variation in practice. So this is term babies, phototherapy, and you can see some of the old graphs people were supplying. They remind me of my youth, because that far side over there, 250, when I was a houseman at UCL years ago, that was our cutoff in a term baby for phototherapy. And I remember it being relaxed up to 300, and now it's more 350 beyond 72 hours of age. And so you can see the accumulation is there. You'll always, when you do this sort of survey, you're always going to get some maverick or something bizarre, aren't you? This 400 on the right-hand side is quite impressive. And for exchange transfusion, again, the spread, where the peak on the left there, perhaps sticking to the old 20 milligrams per cent, 340 micromoles per litre, that was, was the intervention point for all babies at one point, until um, Jeffrey Mazels uh, talked about the kinder, gentler approach to jaundice. If you remember that, you're probably not old enough to remember about 15, 20 years ago, there was a kinder, gentler approach. And so we've moved our thresholds around the 450, some up at this end with the American guidelines at one point for healthy babies. The problem is, when she looked at these graphs, and there's an example here, and I'm not, I'm not making fun of this graph, it was, I think it was a St. Mary's Hospital graph, I think it was Rodney Rivers, who's now retired, who, who put this graph out, and it went round the country. But what this sort of graph shows, and you can't read the small print up there, but I will show you by superimposing it on here, is it has things like need for exchange transfusion in a sick infant. That's, it's also the phototherapy intervention line, but if it's a sick baby, you, you would um, intervene at that point. And then this word need for consideration of exchange treatment in a well infant. And I take Ung's point earlier about the 2010 guideline. I didn't agree with that table that said consider. If you ask someone to consider, they consider and ignore and don't do it. It's a waste of time. It's, you know, consider the risk factors. Well, I considered them and you don't do anything. So what happens with this sort of graph? Um, and this is anonymized. This was, uh, if I plot on the next one, yeah, that's the problem. You set these speed limits and we all exceed the speed limit. And what happened here is this is a 34-week gestation baby. It's plotted on a graph, you can't see at the top there, a 34 to 37-week range. That's what people tended to put gestation ranges on. That's fine, but it was in the, you know, the lower part of that gestation range. And this baby had phototherapy. It never received an exchange transfusion. About halfway through there, as the lines plateau off, the baby got necrotizing enterocolitis. So I think I can say this was a sick baby, never exchanged, even though it's gone over the line that's saying consider it in a well, well baby. 
and it's certainly gone over the line for a sick baby. The problem is here, they've been extremely diligent in measuring the serum bilirubin. They've treated with phototherapy, but they've had this sort of mental block about following their own guideline as to, actually, this baby's sick, at risk, let's do an exchange. Um, and the number of graphs I see like that, where people think, oh, it's just gone over, it'll come down again. And then it goes up again, and it's, it's frustrating. Failure to heed the acute signs of toxicity, I make no bones about showing this picture again of the back arching the opisthotonous posture. Once you see that in a baby, whoops, um, who's severely jaundiced, it's pretty much uh, pathognomonic of acute bilirubin encephalopathy. There's very few other things that are going to cause that in a baby, be that a posterior fossa bleed, a meningitis, you know, this, this, is, this has got to be acute bilirubin encephalopathy. So if it's written in the notes, this baby's back arching, irritable, high-pitched cry, and you're not doing anything other than giving it some light treatment, you're going to be culpable, I'm afraid. So all of those features suggest acute bilirubin encephalopathy. Seizures tend to be put down as apneas. Now, if they're termed babies, why is the baby apneic? If it's not sick, meningitic, why is it having apneas? It's having probably seizures. Uh, don't ignore those features, document them, and use them uh, I to accelerate the process of treating the baby. Failure to use phototherapy properly. Uh, uh, Professor Batani and I were talking earlier on that, that I think it's next year is the 65th anniversary of the development of recognition of, of, of the interaction between light and treatment or the use of phototherapy. 1958 in this country, uh, a guy called Richard Kramer. Uh, we haven't got time to talk about him at length, but he's a, he was, he's a hero of both Vinnie and myself. And this was his first phototherapy unit. He didn't call it that. He called it the cradle illumination machine, which I think actually sounds better. I, th I think when you're back on your units, ask people to bring out the cradle illumination machine. <laughs> Right, this is, uh, this is not me trying to show advanced um, phototherapy. I, I now need to change my terminology to enhanced, was it no, intense, in, intensified phototherapy. Uh, this is showing the use of overhead phototherapy. Uh, I would tend to use the light emitting diodes now myself and using a fiber optic nest that the baby's in to give phototherapy on the baby's back as well. That's how you get a bilirubin down quickly if it's going to respond to uh, to, to high intensity phototherapy. Oh, I try to make the point here uh, this light emitting diode, not putting out heat, you can certainly put it quite a lot closer to the baby. Obviously, you don't exceed the manufacturer's recommended distance, but the thing is, bring it down, optimize the dose, get those close to the baby, and you'll excrete uh, bilirubin much more rapidly. Right, let's have another of Spitzer's laws. What's this one? Oh dear, that's it's a bit of a truism, and we perhaps shouldn't be uh, light-hearted about that sort of thing. Right, now, failure to perform a timely exchange. Um, it's not just because um, uh, uh, Vinny is here, but this is one of my favorite papers, and I, I give it to my, my middle-grade staff if we're talking about urgency of getting on with doing an exchange transfusion in a baby with either hyperbilirubinemia above the exchange level or a baby who's showing acute signs of bilirubin encephalopathy. So what do the authors say? And it's a nice, it's a, it is a very nice paper because there's a nice background in there as well as to the approach to, to jaundice. But specifically I draw from this paper the, the requirement for urgency in optimizing phototherapy, oh, look, I've used the word optimize, that's good. Optimizing phototherapy, cross-matching your blood, get your lines in, get the uh, exchange done. And this all should be able to happen within four to six hours. If it's taking eight, 10, 12 hours, if the baby is sitting in an A&E department in the middle of London because their neonatal unit has decided they're full and they're not going to admit the baby, and it takes several hours to get across London in an ambulance with no phototherapy, arrives at that hospital fitting, then you've messed up. Um, this is acute management. It needs to go ahead. Um, we're fond of uh, terminology in this country. One of the terms that the Americans like to use 
is this approach. And, and Janet Rennie was the first person to tell me. She must have read your paper and said, Kevin, what about the crash cart approach? And this is the crash cart. Wheel out the crash cart and get on with the procedure. And we, we don't tend to say that, but I'm, I'm thinking we, we should do, because I think we should just say. <laughs> right. OK, complications of exchange transfusion. Okay. Who's seen complications of exchange transfusion? Yeah. Who's seen a death from exchange transfusion? Yeah. Otherwise, you see morbidity from exchange transfusions. Exchange transfusions are not a straightforward procedure. There are certain procedures in neonatology that are inherently more risky, more dangerous, particularly if we do them so rarely. And uh, this is one of mine that I particularly uh, uh, take to heart. So other procedures in neonatology that are dangerous. <laughs> this is El Salto del Calaccio, the Devil's Leap. Right. This is practiced in Spain, and it was introduced in 1620 and had links with the Catholic Church at that time. The man, the man in yellow and red depicts the devil. Right? And below him are babies that have been born in the preceding 12 months. They are put down like this, and he leaps over them, and that confers a good fortune to them in the future. It cleanses them. <laughs> Uh, and provides them, <laughs> provides them with an initiation into life uh, and, and, and safeguards them. I'm not sure this mother, this mother here, I think this is the mother here. It's probably one of them. <laughs> I don't think she thinks he's safeguarding them. I, I, I've read up again about this recently. The, it was linked to the Catholic Church, who now, Pope Benedict, is now distancing himself from this, saying it's not a very good thing to have the devil conferring this. I think it's more to do with holy water and that sort of thing. But. So, it's just a, that's the only picture you'll remember from my talk today. <laughs> but it will remind you that exchange transfusions are dangerous. They're particularly dangerous if you do them in a very convoluted, strange way, using plumbing that, uh, that, that is inherently going to be dangerous. So this setup, it looks confusing to start with, doesn't it? Now, which, which, which syringe do you push first? Which do you do next? I, I forbid my team to do an exchange transfusion through a single vessel, the umbilical vein, with two three-way taps in, in, in convoy like that. Why do I do that? Because I think the world is divided into uh, people that can't tell their their left hand from their right hand. I mean, their right hand from their left hand. And also on neonatal units, the world is divided into people who can use a three-way tap and those who can't, who get confused. Now, that, that sounds very rude, but you'll know colleagues who they can't quite work out which way. So you've got two three-way taps there, and you're doing this and this one, and you're pulling here. I have seen a baby on my own unit where each cycle that the operator thought they were putting the baby through for this exchange... There was a period in each cycle where the baby was siphoning directly into the waste blood disposal. The baby went white as a sheet. We recognised this and we just poured in blood and the baby recovered. So that's why I don't like those. OK, you're going to say, well, we, never, we always do it through umbilical artery uh, and umbilical vein. That's perfectly safe. Peripheral artery, peripheral vein. Fine. But if you're using the umbilical vein please, please, please use what I think is one of the great... Whoop, one of the... Um, sorry, I'm having trouble with my slides again. One of the best inventions in neonatology, and I don't know who did invent it, the four-way tap. You're sort of going, what's he talking about? It's difficult to explain on this. This is blood coming from the bag, right, the transfusion bag. If his hand wasn't there, it would be going back into, the, into this tap here, that there. You've then got this one going to the waist, this one going to the baby, and then the fourth part of the four-way tap is to the syringe. All you need to do is go around the clockwise progression, you, you know, drawing off, pushing in, and it's, it, it's perfectly safe. Even in the middle of the night, when, when exchanges always happen in the middle of the night, don't they? You don't get confused. So I, we have skills days. You probably do the same on your unit where we do practice on these sort of things with coloured water and in bags, just to get people used to using the four-way tap. Um, there were other 
complications of exchanges there, which I've just, just rushed over. I think it's time for another of Spitz's laws of neonatology. Um, that's pretty true, isn't it? So, um, just going back to examples where, unfortunately, things go wrong, and the AAP guideline pointing out the babies that are at higher risk of conictrous. There are two examples I want to just take from that. One is G6PD deficiency, and the other is low albumin. So the first one, this is a case of a baby who's got G6PD deficiency, who has some early bilirubins that are just going up a normal line. And then I've, I've recreated this graph and extrapolated it. And this baby must have then had an accelerated hemolysis secondary to a drug stimulant or the, the henna you talked about um, that's caused a, a rapid rise in bilirubin. Now, the defense to this case, which was pre nice, was that the midwives were going in each day and the baby only looked moderately jaundiced. Um, but it obviously then took off in those last um, 24 hours or so. Professor Batani and colleagues have published a paper where they show the different patterns of, of, of uh, bilirubin, uh, f uh, different patterns of this favism pattern, the triggered hemolysis pattern, is the one you really fear. Not many babies with G6PD are truly hemolyzing. Uh, it's, it's, it's this group that have been triggered to do so. So that one catches you out. And the other one is this albumin story, and I, I, I do focus on the albumin. Um, Charles uh, Alfors, uh, an American, in 1994, described the use of the bilirubin to albumin ratio um, to assist in decision making for whether you do an exchange transfusion or not. It certainly hasn't caught on in this country. I think it's a part of the AAP guideline to consider the bilirubin to albumin ratio. Uh, because it is useful, because it gives you a surrogate measure of how much free bilirubin there is. And I'll come back to these ratios, but if the bilirubin to albumin ratio in a term baby is over 0.8, you may be running into the area of toxicity. So if you had a baby with a serum bilirubin of 485, first example, baby one, with an albumin of 40, now to convert 40 grams per litre to micromoles per litre, you've got this number in your head, which I keep in my head, 15.15, and that would give you a bilirubin to albumin ratio of 0.8. So that might be putting that baby at risk. That baby's got a very, he very healthy albumin level. You take that albumin level down to 25 and baby, baby number two there, and you see you achieve that same bilirubin to albumin ratio at a level of 303, which you wouldn't, you'd think 303, who cares about 303? So that's where I think it, it does come into play. I was disappointed that we couldn't find evidence, sufficient evidence, to, to make it a feature of the NICE guideline, either in 2010 or again in 2016, to say that one should be considering the albumin or considering the bilirubin to albumin ratio. There was a trial in Holland looking at it in preterm babies, less than 32 weeks, but it was a very cautious trial with a lot of crossover, and it hasn't really told us anything. But if ever I see a baby that has developed conictrous at a low level of bilirubin, the first thing I look for is the albumin. So let's have the example then. 37 weeks gestation. This baby um, has, has conictrous. It was born in 2013. The hospital was still using their own graph guideline. I'm not sure I can rightly or wrongly uh, criticize them for that, but this was 37 weeks plus. Um, and you see the bilirubin going up there, and it peaks, this is the phototherapy line, this is the exchange transfusion, it peaks at 444, just below uh, the uh, threshold for exchange transfusion. If they'd been using the NICE guideline, then perhaps they would have gone ahead with an exchange transfusion. This baby was asymptomatic. But when you look quite closely at the, the bilirubin levels and the albumin, you see that this baby's albumin, the second column there, came down to 17 grams per deciliter. It was 21 there. The baby had had severe RDS, and you're like, you can have an associated hypoalbuminemia with that. 
the peak bilirubin was 444, as I say. And so the bilirubin to albumin ratios that I plot that I've listed up there certainly are very abnormal, <coughs> even despite this baby's having quadruple therapy. Um, a little bit more assessment, and that's where I like Vinny's approach of a panel assessment, you know, taking into account not just the bilirubin, but also the albumin, the bilirubin to albumin ratio, perhaps the entitled CO if it's a pathological jaundice with a risk of hemolysis. Um, and taking all that into account, that baby probably would have been treated more aggressively at a lower level. And I think that is the future to try and avoid this sort of damage. Uh, right, Spitzer's Laws of Neonatology, one of my favourites, is the last one of them. You all know surgeons like that, I'm sure. Uh, right, just a few points to, to minimise malpractice risk. Um, yeah. Be up to date, use guidelines, use the 2016 guidelines, sorry. Um, uh, keep all your old guidelines and what you were doing, because if someone comes back to you, 20, you know, with a, about a case from 20 years ago, well, what, what were you using? What graph were you using? What was your justification for the treatment of, of that baby? Um, talk to parents apologize appropriately, the whole era of duty of candor you're aware of, document your procedures, complications and any conversation, and keep records. If you don't keep records, it didn't happen. Okay, you might keep records that are damning, you know, the fact that the baby is symptomatic and you're not done anything about it, but that's, that's honest. But if you don't record records, it's assumed that things didn't happen. Uh, have a lot, lots of good staff, um, plenty of good staff. I used to work in Brighton, and the, the neonatal nurses down there were just so capable. I mean, this one here can look after 11 babies at once. <laughs> uh, Minimise malpractice risk again. Document te telephone advice. I, I was reading through the notes of a, a baby who developed connectress from the other end of the country. And I was going through the pages, and then it just suddenly said, discussed with Dr. Ives in Oxford. I thought, what? <laughs> um, and... It seemed to be reasonable advice that I'd given, but did I have any record of that conversation? Vague memory. I hadn't written down. I should have done. It doesn't just apply to connectress cases. If you're being asked by colleagues somewhere else, you should be writing it down. Uh, incident reporting, you know all about that. Collecting contem contemporaneous witness statements. Talk to your hospital legal department at an early stage if you think something's gone wrong and this baby is symptomatic. But in the more, you know, it, 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 all is not lost. Uh, don't feel alone in this situation. We all get sued at some stage. Um, in the immortal words of Corporal Jones, don't panic. Now, I sometimes had to explain this, maybe not to this audience, but uh, Cliff Robertson, who, uh, who was the chief editor of Robertson's textbook for a long while, he wrote a chapter on medical negligence in his, in his own book, and he referenced uh, Corporal Jones saying, don't panic. And so he had to say, look, the, Perry and Croft, these are the screenwriters, 1970s, Dad's Army, a BBC series about the home guard in the 1939-45 war. Which I think is fantastic. It shows his sense of humour. He was a very humorous guy. Um, but I can imagine how bewildered people are at the other side of the world <laughs> reading this chapter, thinking, what's he talking about? But it is true. Because these are not very nice places to go to. Um, there's a legal world out there. This is our world. We're not familiar with that world. But I must say, over the years, um, through looking at cases, discussing them in depth, it's almost a forensic approach to each case, that I've learned a lot about um, connectress and bilirubin and cephalopathy. Uh, I think Janet Rennie and I have, have both said that when we, when we retire, which will probably be a bit simultaneous, we're not actually retiring together. I don't want to start that rumour, but... Um, <laughs> When we retire, which will be fairly, we're going to look back over the cases, and it might be 100 cases or more, and I think you can learn a lot from those cases. Just, just as Jeffrey Maisels and, and Newman looked at their cases and they identified those six babies who got connectress without any risk factors at all, just got severe hyperbilirubinemia. So we do learn from the legal profession. I thank you for your attention. Thank you.